Oh, how wonderful to hear that backstage comment. We did it, we did it. Oh my god, oh my god, we did it. We didn't stop. We did it. No stopping. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, that was lovely. Thank you. Are you drained or you need your water? Of course you do. Come on in. Please sit down. Where would you like us to sit? Michael? Anywhere. Doesn't even have to be boy, girl, boy, girl. Oh. Are you drained? He's just a little. Pretty drained. You're just coming right off stage. You know, there's nothing like a love story. Nothing. Right before, uh, Stephen Sondheim told us that passion is one un uh, seamless rhapsody, one long love song. Tell us your interpretations of the music and this one long love song and what it took for you to get yourselves ready. Michael? Michael? Um, well, it's... It it, it's especially sort of long and varied, I think, for Giorgio. Um, you know, he starts in one entirely different place from one where he ends at the end of the play. Um, I think really all you can do is sort of uh, put yourself truly in his place at every moment through the story. And what James and Stephen have done so exquisitely is, is detail every every step along that long and, and impossible route and 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 then filled it with every emotion along the way so every it's really emotion. the whole gamut every emotion patty what makes it song time oh my god well the lyrics and the music and um it's i i, I pray Every time I do a Sondheim show, and we, we, the three of us do them at the Ravinia Festival, and they're fast, they're very fast, that I remember the lyrics because he is so um, complicated and so brilliant. And then the music, and I, I, I don't know what's more complicated or what's more, uh, more difficult to achieve, his, his music accurately or the lyrics. Um, he, this is particularly beautiful music. I mean, he writes great character stuff, but this is someone bearing his heart, and it's, I, I, I don't know what to say. Audra, you talk. Audra, let me ask Audra about whether Stephen Sondheim actually helps you. Does he show up at rehearsals? Does he participate? Oh, well, Steve's around. <laughs> yes, Steve's always around. No, it's, it's actually quite wonderful, too, because what I, I find most moving about Stephen Sondheim, even though, you know, we've all lauded him as the genius that he is, you know, the, the, the legend that is Broadway, that is Stephen Sondheim, this is a man who's still working on his stuff. He's still trying to make it better, right? you know. I remember even when we did Sweeney Todd a couple years ago. He's like, you know, I always thought that maybe this note should be this instead of, you know. I mean, he's still working. So he changes on it. it as you well, move through not it. necessarily, but he's just still trying to imagine ways that he can improve upon his already brilliant work, which makes him a true artist. I think but he's never satisfied. In that is way. he there for the rehearsals? Is he? Yeah. Sometimes yeah, I mean, yes, it, it, it varies, you know, from production to production. This he's seen us do before, so I think he, you know, felt a little more at ease, sort of, you know, leaving us. But he came in, you know, for the end. So. Oh, yeah. I got a lot of notes from him. <laughs> <laughs> the other day, I got a lot of notes from him. Uh, but when when I heard Rhapsody for the first time, all his notes made total sense. But we hadn't, I haven't heard that word uh, spoken about mm -hmm. in this piece, you know, in my rehearsal period with Audra and Michael at Ravinia or here until Steve just brought it up yesterday I think. You know the thing is when the, it's it really is like Shakespeare in that if you do what's written and truly do what's written without imposing yourself or anything else on it you can't fail really and and if you really truly just present what's there it, it will be yeah, you know. Yeah, it serves you. You exactly. don't need to do anything. You just... Why is this not considered opera? It's it's basically sung all the way through. There's very little dialogue. I mean, those, I think Maybe that's the reason. Yeah. Because there is there's just a little dialogue. Yeah. And that... But, you know, even there, in Magic Flute, there's dialogue as well. I think what it is is that because people consider Steve to be a, a musical theater composer. Right. Yeah. That's the only reason. But I can see opera companies doing this. I mean, the, the roles are, I mean, vocally quite demanding and, and quite operatic. So I could certainly see it. it is, I consider it to be sort of a chamber opera. Yeah. But I also think that it's not considered opera because Stephen doesn't write for opera. He right. writes for, you know, 45th Street. He writes for Broadway. Right. Is, yes. it, is this one of the more challenging roles 
for me, definitely. Mm. For you. Well, yes. I, uh, for me, yeah. yeah. For me, costume-wise. <laughs> <laughs> costume. costume. Uh, having to wear a Buick on stage is a lot of work and not fall. But, yeah. but for Patty, I mean, you, this is one of the more unusual roles uh, for Broadway, to have a, a, a woman made completely homely and become the love, love object. What, what, how did you prepare yourself? For because I, I am and have been Fosca in my life. I mean, I think there's a lot. Have, yeah, there's a lot have. to relate to in, in this woman. And I'm Italian, so the, the worse they made me look, the better. <laughs> well, I want you to know you're beautiful. You're beautiful, and you are beautiful. And thank, thank you. you so very much. Thank what a you. special, special night. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much.